everybody at Cash of Fire Scarborough and all those watching online. We are so happy to have you with us on this Sunday morning. Um, what a delight it is to be here with you to share from the Word of the Lord today. A couple of weeks ago, those of you who have been paying attention and watching, a couple of weeks ago we were in Muskoka and Elsie, my wife, was speaking on the um, topic of having a different spirit. And she was focusing in on um, Caleb and Joshua, the story of Caleb and Joshua, and how they were so different from the rest of the people of Israel. And as she was sharing that, in fact, since, since, since she, she's been sharing that, I have been ruminating on that passage. And I find it very fascinating. I think it's challenging for us. I think it's also the Lord has a word for us from that passage now. I really believe it. And so what we'll do this morning is I'm going to look at the passage again uh, in brief numbers. Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14. It's a whole, whole, whole two chapters we need to read. So I wouldn't take the time to read it. You can read it at home at your, in your, at your, in your leisure time. You can read the Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And I'll just go over the story briefly and highlight a couple of important points, but then draw out from it what I believe would be four characteristics that existed in Caleb and Joshua that made them different, right? So the question to ask is, why were Caleb and Joshua different than the rest of the Israelites, than the rest of the other spies that went into the land? I mean, they all came from the same sort of background, right? They were all slaves in Egypt, they were being brought out of Egypt, and around the two-year mark, they were on the edge of the promised land. And, and the Lord said to the people, said to Moses, take uh, representative, representatives from each of the tribes and send them into the land to check it out and then bring back a report to prepare the people for what, they for what I have in store for them. Because he had promised from the very beginning that he was, he was going to bring them out of Egypt, but not just bring them out of Egypt, out of slavery and, and um, mistreatment and, and, uh, and abuse and all these negative things. He was going to bring them out of, out of that place, but bring them into a place which he's calling the promised land, a land that's flowing with milk and honey which represents, you know, bounty and goodness and fertility and a fantastic place to live. That was his promise. I'll take you out of there and bring you into this place. And so he asked Moses to send some people, send some spies in advance to check out the land so that they would bring back a report which would encourage the people as they prepared to go in, right? That's, that's, that was the intention. However, Things went a little bit sideways. Before we, before we go any further, I'm going to pause and just pray because I really want to make sure that the Lord um, has His way in, uh, in us through this word this morning. So Father, we just thank You for Your presence. Thank You for Your word. Thank You for Your presence with us. And Father, I ask that even as we share from Your word and share from this story, Lord, would You speak to our hearts by the power of your spirit. Those who are in this room right now, those who are watching online whenever they watch this, Lord, I pray that you would speak words of life, words of encouragement, words, words of hope, words of affirmation, words of challenge to each and every one of us, that we would step into all that you have for us, even in the midst of a time when there's so much uncertainty, so much movement left and right and center, Lord, we're asking for solid ground. We're asking for hope. We're asking for your precious and sure promises for each and every one of us. Come, Holy Spirit, make this thing live. Make it live in our hearts. In Jesus' awesome name, amen. So Moses sends off these 12 people into the promised land and they spend 40 days looking around at, at all of the fertility in the, in the land. They even brought back um, some massive amount of grapes. I and mean, if they had mangoes, I'm sure they would have brought back some mangoes as well as bananas 
uh, papayas and all that good stuff. But, but they, 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 they looked around and they saw how, how wonderful it was, but they were also conscious of the fact that the people were, there were lots of people in the land and there were um, numerous people and they seemed powerful. Their cities were fortified. So they come back now, these 12 spies come back and they give this report that man, the place is beautiful, it's really wonderful, it's bountiful, it's fertile, but the people are big and they're powerful and I don't think that we can ever overcome them because they're too powerful for us. And that was the report. It's great, it's a great place to be, but we can't go because we can't do it. We don't have the power. Joshua and Caleb were the only two ones of the 12 spies who said, no, 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 no. The Lord is with us. The Lord has spoken. He has promised that he was going to take us from Egypt and bring us into the promised land. And the Lord is sure we can trust his word because we've seen what he's done in the past. We've seen the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the plagues in Egypt. We see the manna from heaven. We see the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day to, to, to protect us from the sun, the pillar to lead us. We've seen all these amazing, wonderful miracles and signs and wonders of God's power, but His also His, His protective care of us. We've seen these things, and our focus is on that. So when He said that He's going to give us the land, we can trust that He's going to give us the land. That was their orientation. The rest of the people was, were, were focused on, oh my gosh, look how massive this is. Now in their defense, okay, I'm trying to read myself into the story. So I would say in their defense, we need to remember that these folks, these, these 10 spies and all the people of Israel that listened to them, they were coming out, they were only two years away from 400 years, 400 years of oppressive slavery and being downtrodden and being oppressed. 400 years. If, a, if, if, if one generation is 40 years, that's 10 generations. 10 times, is that right? Love more. Right. Yes. <laughs> 10 generations, year after year, of living in oppression, living um, uh, enslaved by a much more powerful people, right? Who are badly, who are mistreating them very badly. And so they were, they were living with that, that mindset, that mentality. We, are, we can't do anything. We're weak. We're incapable. We, we, we're easily beaten up. So they're living with us. And they were only two, two years away from that reality. Yeah? So even, for example, when um, they would hear the whispers, because it was an, or, an oral culture, and they would hear the promises that God had given to the people. Like, for example, when, when Joseph, who was the one who was responsible for them coming into Egypt in the first place, he says, he said, that when you leave this place, when the Lord takes you from this place and takes you into the promised land, make sure you take my bones with me. I know I'm going to die in Egypt, but make sure that you take your bones with me. That was Joseph's statement of faith. He was convinced that the Lord was going to bring the people out of Egypt and bring them into the, prom into the promised land. And he was saying, as a statement of faith, when this happens, not if, but when this happens, make sure you take my bones with you because I don't want, to, I don't want, my, I don't, I don't want my bones to be left here. I want them to be in the land that God has promised us. So the people would have heard that. I imagine they would have heard that and other stories. Right? Moses, for example, the little baby, miraculously, I won't take the time to tell you the story, but he was um, supposed to have been killed because he was a, a, a Hebrew baby. But it turns out that his mother ended up taking care of him under the Pharaoh's household. Miraculous work of the Lord. And that's where he learned who he was. Even though he grew up in, in Egypt, in all the ways of Egypt, he knew in his heart that he was a Hebrew and that God had a plan and a, and a destiny for him and he was a proper child. They, he, they knew these things. 
But the point I'm making is this. Even though they heard these stories, even though they heard the promises of God, their reality, their, their flesh and blood reality of oppression and pain and struggle was too much for them. They, they placed more weight on that than on the word of the Lord. Amen? You getting the picture? So in their defense, I could, I could understand how in the natural, that's how they would be. But Joshua and Caleb were of a different spirit. They were a different spirit. So why in heaven were they different? Can anybody tell me, why were Joshua and Caleb different from the rest of the ten spies and the rest of the other Israelites who sided with the ten spies? I'll tell you why. There may, there may be many reasons or many um, characteristics of, of Joshua and Caleb. I'll give you four. You guys are ready? I'll give you four characteristics of Joshua and Caleb that caused them to be different. We actually don't know a lot about Caleb, apart from when the story starts in, Rome, in, uh, in, uh, in Hebrews, not Hebrews, Numbers, Numbers 13 and 14. That's when we first learn about Caleb. He was the son of Yafenu, who was of the tribe of Judah. So maybe for you prophetic people, you'll, 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 the, the lights will go on. Judah, the tribe of Judah, praise. Oh, he was a man of praise, maybe. Okay, so we don't know very much about Caleb. We, we know a little bit more of the backstory of Joshua because we know that when Moses went up the mountain to meet with God, Joshua was there. He was out of the frame of the picture, but he was right there, right? He was right there with Moses when God and Moses were meeting and having discourse together. When God was speaking to Moses, Joshua was right there in the tent of meeting when Moses would go, would, would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp and he would meet with God, there would be a pillar of, uh, sorry, a cloud, of, a cloud that would come and shroud the tent of meeting when Moses was speaking to God face to face like a man speaks to his friend. Uh, Joshua was there. Joshua, in fact, it even says in one place that when Moses left that tent of meeting, Joshua remained. So we know something about Joshua. We know that Joshua, this is point number one of the four, point number one, Joshua, and I'm assuming Caleb as well, but Joshua was definitely the man who loved the presence of God. He loved seeking God's presence. He loved being where the presence of God was thick. And it's in that presence of God that he encountered God. He encountered God in that place. And it's in that process that he was transformed. He had such a hunger. He was no longer, no longer like the rest of the Israelites. Right? He had a, he had a, a fire in his heart for God. He had a passion in his heart for God. Amen? Is that fair to say? He loved dwelling. I bet you if Joshua and David lived at the same time, they would, be, they would say the same thing. If you would ask Joshua, Joshua, what's the one thing that you want with your life? What's the, one, what's the one big desire of your heart? I bet you he would say Psalm 27 4, Kayan. I bet you he would say, One thing I ask, one thing I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold his beauty and to meditate in his temple. That's what Joshua would have said. Because he lived it out. He lived in a tent, in a tent of meeting even when Moses had finished his time with God, Joshua stayed behind. He was there with Moses up in the mountain and he loved, he loved the presence of God. So if we want, the, the reason why I'm bringing these four points up, my people, my brothers, my sisters, I'm bringing these four points up because if we want to have the kind of spirit that Joshua and David, Joshua and Caleb have, had, these, at, least, at least these four things have to, be, have to be part of our lives as well. We have to have such a, I have to have such a hunger in my heart for the presence of God. 
I have to have. This has been speaking to me, okay? It's not just me, me preaching to you. This has been speaking to me as well. We really need, especially in this day, in this hour, when there's so much uncertainty around and, um, you know, uh, you, I mean, you, you folks are all, all aware of what's happening in the world right now. COVID and this, that, the other. And there's so much uncertainty about how the future is going to unfold. The only way we're going to keep a sound mind, a clear heart in this time, is when, the, uh, is when the, the primary thing, the primary voice in our lives is the voice of God, the voice of His Word, the voice of His promises in our lives that gives us security, that gives us stability, gives us a sense of direction, a sense of purpose. So we got to be like Joshua, we got to be like Caleb, who just love, love, love the presence of God, way beyond religion and religiosity and churchianity. I hope, I hope you, get, you guys realizing that those days are fast disappearing, okay? There's a shifting going on even within the context of the church. And in, the, in, this, in this shifting, in this shaking, the people who will remain are the people who, have, who first and foremost have a passion for the person of Jesus himself. Nothing else. Seek me first, Jesus says. Seek first the kingdom of God and its, and its righteousness and all these things else will find their proper place. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek me first. Seek Jesus first. Make him priority in our lives, in every aspect of our lives. Whether it's our careers, whether it's our uh, family, marriages, whether it's our um, recreation, the way we spend our money, even the, the, stu- the, the way we view church. Make Jesus the center. Let him be the priority in every aspect of our lives. Not religiosity, not churchianity, but the person of Jesus. Encountering the person of Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Okay, next point. Well, before we go, let me just make, mention one more thought. Because this morning, I was sitting in my usual spot doing my devotions. And Elsie, my wife, was sitting across there. As we, as we normally do. And I'm reading Galatians chapter 4. Okay, I'm reading Paul's letters to the Galatians. And in chapter 4, Paul says, Before you, were, um, before you did not know God. Before you did not know God. But now you know God through Jesus Christ. And further, you are known by God. Before you did not know God, now you know God through Jesus Christ, but even more, you are known by God. When I read that, I had to pause because that phrase, you are known by God, challenged me. I mean, God knows everything, doesn't he? That's part of being God. If, if you're God, uh, one of your attributes is omniscience, means you know everything, right? So he knows the number of hairs on your head, the Bible says. He knows everything. So why is Paul saying, you know, you, 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 what's special about this is that you're known by God? And so and as I reflected on it, it dawned on me that obviously Paul isn't talking about that kind of knowledge. You know, God, God knows everything, so he knows everybody. Uh, what Paul is really talking about is not the, God's factual knowledge of you. He's talking about God's relational knowledge of you and me. Right? God knows us in terms of relationship because A, we started, off by, we started off this relationship with Him in Christ. We said yes to Jesus. Jesus came and lived in our hearts. The Father came and lived in our heart. The Holy Spirit came and lived in our heart. And so we now have this living, relational connection to God, which, which goes way beyond facts. Right? I know certain facts about uh, uh, Pierre, not Pierre, what's his name? Trudeau. What's his name? Our famous Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. That's how well I know him. Um, 
I know certain facts about him, okay? But he knows nothing about me. However, if I went to Ottawa to 22 Sussex Drive, knocked on his door, maybe if the, if the RCMP don't shoot me, I get, to, I, I get to, to meet Trudeau, and then he would know me, right? He, we would have a relationship. And I would be known by, by Justin Trudeau. In the very same way, when we, when we say yes to Jesus, we enter into a relationship where we are known by God. We are known by God. And we cannot be known by God in this way apart from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That is what the Bible teaches. So anyway, moving right along. Point number two. So first of all, they, they desired to have a relationship with God. They desired to know God and, and to be known by Him. They desired to live in His presence. Number two, they believed God and they believed His promises. They believed God and they believed His promises. It's, it's not just cool you know, to, to, to sort of know God. It's very important to actually believe His promises. They looked at the world around them through the lens of God's promises. They looked at the world around them. They looked at the fact that they just come from 400 years of slavery and abject suffering in that land of Egypt. And then they're looking forward to the promised land. And in between that past and the future, they're in this place and all they have with any degree of conviction and security are the promises that God spoke to them. And so they held on to those promises. They were looking at their circumstances through the lens of God's promises. The other Israelites were doing the exact opposite. They were looking at their circumstances through the eyes Sorry, they were looking at their circumstances without looking at the promises of God. They were looking at, their, at the promises of God through the lens of their suffering and of their circumstances. Am I making sense? Yes. It's crucial, everybody. Everybody in the room and everybody online is crucial to view this world through the lens of faith, through the eyes of faith. Through the, through the lens of God's promises for us. Otherwise, we are in danger of missing, and I say this with, with a great degree of sobriety, we, we, we are in danger of missing out on all that the Lord wants to give to us, all the Lord wants to do in and through our lives. Amen? Can I get an ear somebody? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come <laughs> Number three, or maybe number two. No, whatever is it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here, here, let's take a pause. What are the promises? What are the promises that God has spoken to you and to me? What are the promises that God has spoken to you and to me? I, I had to do this. In fact, even today I was doing this. What are some of the promises that God has spoken to me over my lifetime? And because... They seem so outlandish or because they haven't come to pass yet. They were given to me, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they haven't been fulfilled. And so my assumption is that, you know, you know maybe, maybe I misunderstood how the application of that promise, how it, would be, how it would be fulfilled. Maybe I'll get to know everything when I go to heaven to be with Jesus forever. Okay? That's one way to look at life. Um, so I actually did that today. I actually, I had to look at my promises. Lord, what have you promised me in my life that I have actually disregarded, undervalued, pushed aside, put them in the recycling bin or the garbage bin, the blue bin, the brown bin, the, the, the green bin. I put it in some bin. So I'm going to encourage us this morning to take some time to look at the promises that God has spoken to us, whether through a prophetic word or as we read the scriptures, as He's spoken to our heart, however God has spoken to us, especially those promises that resonate with us, that really, man, I would love for that to be true. Right? Those promises, latch onto those promises, 
Bring them before the Lord. Repent if you have to. Ask God to forgive you for, for, for not believing or for not looking rightly at those promises. And just help him, ask Him to help us to uh, reawaken faith and reawaken belief in those promises. Amen? You know, for us at Cash of Fire Scarborough, right, in this very moment, we are in a situation where we need to see God's promise. In, this, in our situation at Cash of Fire Scarborough, right now, we, have, we, have, we need to see the hand of God move. Because we believe that we, are, we should be meeting together as a congregation in person again. Now there are people who will not be able to meet with us as, as we gather, and that's totally fine. Uh, you know, we, we, we do what we need to do based on faith and based on our circumstances of life, but we do feel that we're called to meet together. However, we don't have a place to meet. And the place we used to meet in probably will not be available to us in the future, probably. So we're in that place now where we have to latch on to the promise of God when He said to us, I will give you a building. Amen. He told us, even when we, I remember Isabel Alam coming to our church within weeks of us moving into this, new, into this place that we were at, and she says, this, this building is a short stepping stone because the Lord has a place for you. Come on. Come on. Right? So I, I am fully convinced that we're in this place right now where we get to choose to trust in what the Lord has said. By the way, it's not just Isabel Alam saying that. We have felt that in our own heart that the Lord wants to give us a building. So... We're taking that promise and we're bringing it before the Lord. And we're saying, Lord, you promised. This is, the, this is your word to us. And we're going to hold on to that word until we see it come to pass. Whether it's in a couple of weeks or a couple of whenever. You know, we're going to, we're going to believe you to make that happen. Amen? Amen. And the beautiful thing about that, the beautiful thing is that we're believing God for something that only He can do. Yeah. Because we cannot make this happen in our own resources. We don't, you know, naturally speaking, we don't have the financial resources to own a building. We don't, we just can't do it. So, but the Lord has promised. Therefore, He will supply. Amen. Will He not? Come on. In the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, point number three. Let's go a little bit faster now. Point number three. They were wholehearted in their devotion to God. They were wholehearted. In fact, it, every time they mention, it, the story mentions uh, Caleb, it's, it's not too long before it mentions that he was wholehearted. He was wholehearted in his devotion to God and in his calling that God had given to him. Wholeheartedness, everybody. It's, an, it's God is looking for wholeheartedness. Nobody likes a half-hearted person, do they? Nobody wants to be half-hearted, half right? We want to be wholehearted. What, what does a wholehearted person look like? While there is no place for anything but full devotion, we bring everything that we are, everything that we have, we bring it, to the Lord. In fact, if we were poker, poker, poker playing people, it's as though we're pushing our chips, all of our chips, into the middle of the table and we're betting everything on who God is and what He said to us. Amen? Come on. That's what wholeheartedness is. It's giving everything, trusting God radically. Wholeheartedness also includes passion, everybody. Includes passion. When Caleb and Joshua, when the spies came back and they were giving their reports and the people listened to the ten spies and the whole nation pretty much uh, wanted, wanted to rebel against Moses, uh, Moses and Aaron. They wanted to rebel and those four guys, Aaron, Moses, Joshua and Caleb, they 
fell on their faces in front of all the people of Israel. They fell on their faces and they, they tore their garments, a gesture of grief. They were, their hearts were broken that they couldn't, they, they couldn't win the people over. Uh, so the point I'm making there is that wholeheartedness includes passion. Passion, man. Passion, Sybil. I got to keep going. I think it also speaks a bit of, of, of a bit about humility as well. Humility is an important feature in all this. That they were willing to do that. They were willing to ex- to um, become vulnerable like that, tearing their clothes and 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 being prostrate, face down in front of all these people who wanted to kill them. But because of their heart after God and because they, they, they were so con- convinced that God wanted to use them, use the whole nation to bless the world, that they were willing to, you know, throw themselves basically at the feet, at the mercies of the people to get their attention. So don't be, uh, don't be ha- half-hearted. Don't be double-minded either. Point number four. They were courageous. Point number one is? They loved the presence of God. Point number two is? They believe God and His promises. Point number three is? They were wholehearted. And point number four is they were courageous in the midst of fear. They were courageous in the midst of fear. It's important to have those two things in, ten, in, 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 in the same sentence. You have to have courage in the midst of fear. Because when there is no fear, there is no need for courage. Does that make sense? You only can ex- exhibit courage when there is something to be courageous about uh, or when, when you are facing fear. And so the beauty of it is that courage doesn't mean that there is no fear. Courage means that you make the choice to step over fear and to do what you know God has called you to do, and to be what God has called you to be. So don't let fear stifle what God wants to do. In fact, in, in, in the passage there it says, um, Joshua and Caleb cried out to the people and says, men of, uh, men of Israel, do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people. Do not rebel against, do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people. Because those things are tied together. Because their fear of the people were actually leading them to be rebellious against God. Fear is a horrible thing, everybody. As best as you can, get fear out of your life. And by getting fear out of your life, I don't mean there's an absence of fear. Don't let fear have any control over your decision-making process. Amen? As best as you can. Don't let there be controlling fears that limit what you know God has called you to do. There are way too many of us people, there are way too many of us who have lived lives and have been living lives not based on courage in in the face of fear, but fear in the face of problems or potential problems. Amen? We must change that. The world needs a church. The world, this world right now, in the midst of the craziness of COVID and economic crisis and all the societal problems that are around, the world needs a church that has a little bit of gonads. Can we say that in church? The world needs a church that has a little bit of conviction about the power of God in us. We're we're never relying on ourselves at all because we ourselves have nothing to offer anybody. But what we do have is a God who has chosen to take up residence in us and who wants to flow in us and through us to make an impact on the world. Does he not? I'm preaching to myself more than to anybody else in this room or anywhere else on the planet. All right.
Um, what else should I be talking about? Anything else? Because even Joshua and Caleb, by the way, if you read the story, they even said, they even agreed that the people were too powerful, of, too powerful for us. The people over there, our enemies, they're too powerful for us. They said that. However, they said, but God, but God, but God is with us. Yes, the people are too powerful for us, but they're not too powerful for God. Your enemy, whatever they may be, whether they're internal or external, your enemy may be too powerful for you in your own strength, but your enemy will never be too strong for you if you're with God and if God is with you. Amen? All right, so I'm going to stop there, and then I'm going to have Elsie come, and we'll just take a few minutes just to pray for people. I have more to say, but we'll stop there. Shukura, Papa. You may need the microphone now. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Shukura, Papa. Oh, that's so good. You want to go? Thank you, Lord. As Arish was speaking, I could almost hear the Father's heart beat. You know, he doesn't just sit there looking at us. He's engaged with us. He's longing, longing, longing for us to know him the way that he really is. And he doesn't lie to us. Mm. You know, for many weeks, uh, he's been talking about himself, the many different aspects of his nature, of who he is. Do you know why he keeps talking? Because we need to know him the way that he wants us to know him. And longing after his presence, he wants us to actually encounter his, his, his character, his nature. Joy was telling me uh, before the service just how, how much she likes him. Isn't it great to be able to like God? Not to just love him, but to also know that he likes us. And Joshua and Caleb, God liked them. They wanted to be with him, and he wants to be with and even now we pray. We just pray that our hearts would be moved towards Him, that we would make those choices to be with Him, to shut down devices, or just not to get that phone call, just, just to move, move closer to the fire. I believe He's just calling people even now. It's like, don't be afraid of quietness. I want to talk to you. I want to be with you. And when you're in that place, he's saying, I want you to believe me when I talk to you. I'm going to open your ears. But I want you to believe my word and hang on to it. I want you to be wholeheartedly invested in the life that I have for you. He wants this for us. And He is giving us courage. Even, even this morning, or whenever it is that you tune in, you have to hear His heart. This is the Father speaking to us. He is the one that gives us the courage to be able to live this life. He infuses his love. It says a perfect love casts out fear. There's only one perfect love, and that's him. God is love. Jesus came to demonstrate who the Father was, to represent him. And today, we just surrender our lives back to you. If you've been on this journey a long time, and you're weary, 
you, you've probably been challenged like Ruish and I have about this passage. And we're going to go pick up some of those promises. We're going to believe together for our church building. We're going to believe together for small groups and home groups where we can come together and nurture each other. And there's any one of you that has been um, listening, can you hear the Father say, gather, gather? He wants safe places where he can reveal himself in, in safe homes and gatherings. I believe this is the first step for us as a congregation, as a church family. To make room for him in our homes this way, and in our friendships, and in our families, and gather. And I believe wholeheartedly that he is going to provide a building, but it's not the building that he's after. It's the building on the inside of us, that knitting together of community. And we pray that today. We pray that. That we will, we will be able to to hear what he's saying to us today. Thank you, I believe there's somebody out there who, uh, there may be more than one person, who uh, you, you feel caught in this place of, you know, looking back at your, uh, on your past, and you see the, you know, past mistakes and just bad things that have happened, things that have happened to you, and your past has been you know, a bit messy. And then you look to the future, and there's so much uncertainty and not enough clarity and there's no, no, clear, way, no clear way forward. And so you're, you're hemmed in between what, what, what's past and what's ahead, what's ahead of you. And I believe that uh, what the Lord wants to say to you is that you can trust Him. That He's actually with you right now in that place. His promise to you is that He will never leave you. He will never, he will never forsake you. He's just asking for you to say yes to Him, to open up your heart to Him, and He will come, and He will take you by the hand, and He will lead you forward. His promise to you is that He has such great plans for you, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to help you to make life go well for you. All he's requiring from you is for you to say yes to him, to invite him in to your world, to invite him to lead you forward, and he will do that for you. So Father, I pray right now, that if there's anybody like that, there are people like that out there right now watching this, and I pray that you would come alongside them by your spirit, Lord, let them, let them sense your presence with, with them. Let them sense your peace. Lord, even physically, let them experience physically in their bodies a tangible touch of the God of heaven, the creator of God, who knows everything about them, who loves them, uh, and has such a good plan for them. Come, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Catch the Fire Scarborough. Is there more to life than this? Questions like this bubble up deep down within everyone at some point. The Alpha Course is a place to ask those questions, and we're starting it on October 7th at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. Will you invite people to attend Alpha with you? They could be a random strangers off the street, but it usually has a little more impact when you invite someone that you have some kind of relationship with already. If you're willing to invite people, you don't need to take it personally if they say no. Invite five people. Hopefully one of them will say yes. Ask Jesus about who you can invite and see who pops into your mind. Would you be interested in coming to a course with me that explores questions of faith? Friends, this simple question could totally change someone's life. 
We hope to see you on Zoom with your invitees on October 7th. Find the Zoom link in the e news.